Notes from the Ahead, The Checkup, written by Oliver Arnold, performed by Adam Eleven Labs. This account of a hospital visit on Space Station Hoch has reached me on the evening of June 24th, 2018. The transmission began while I was removing winter decorations from my living room when an oscillating noise caught my attention. This was not one of my perimeter alarms I knew, as the sound had a calm, unhurried quality to it, attracting not disquieting. Neither TV nor AM radio were on, so, naturally, I checked the toaster as it had emitted sounds and voices before. But that wasn't it, and I searched everything, from my metal detector to the helmets to the fuel canisters, without luck. The sound just seemed to come from everywhere. Suddenly, an uncanny inspiration struck me, and I dug through my heaps of aluminum foil, parted the ammo boxes, and moved the portable toilet to finally lay eyes upon the hooting source, the 220-volt wall receptacle. Never before had an outlet called me so strongly. Surely this was no malfunction. With a degree in electro, I knew what to do. All of my metal coat hangers were used for an art project, leading me to browse the house for an alternate receptor. I recalled that my new dowsing rod had been delivered, with a heavy heart, I straightened it and rammed its ends into the socket. When I woke some hours later, my head was filled with memories that weren't my own. I believe it was this energy that held the transmission belonging to an anonymous patient in the future about whom I must now report. The desire to relay their experience, to prepare the past, our here and now, for the healthcare system of their time, must have been strong as I imagine the person underwent significant trouble to transmit this account. But who knows? Perhaps in the days to come, knowledge will be commonly shared with the tomorrow and the yesterday, and we're just now at the threshold of many more transmissions to come. Regardless of the intentions or implications, I see it as my burden to publish this transcription to the best of my memory. Note that the report is written in the past tense, as events have previously been experienced by a person in times ahead. Beginning of Transcription Dear Post, congratulations. You're in the first batch of mail from my brand new communicator. I love this thing. It's fast and efficient, though I occasionally lose messages. Hopefully the smarts infused into this machine will sort these issues out, or perhaps there's a genius behind its operation that eludes me. That aside, I wanted to tell you about the outrageous experience I suffered at the hospital here on Hawk the other day. As you may know, these businesses aggressively peddle their services these days, especially now that they've moved into the red light district. Loan sharks, gambling, massage parlors, and infirmaries are now all on one level. A logical and natural synergy, I guess. Entirely without plans to visit any such place that morning, I lounged at the casino for a quick game, winning a lot, when my suit's horn alarm went off. I needed the bathroom. Heading to the usual location, I found that the doors had been blocked by one-armed bandits. Signs pointed to the new bathroom location, and I followed them, entered, and they had me. This was not a bathroom at all, but a long corridor leading into a dark room with two letters on its wall. E.R. Anticipating what would come next, I turned frantically but found no handle on this side of the door. Multiple shadows, bandits of a different kind, came running, and before I knew what had hit me, I stood on a scale. One ninety! An extraterrestrial nurse yelled toward someone out of sight. I, I'm sorry, I stuttered. That's twenty pounds more than I usually weigh, gesturing at my spacesuit as perhaps the source of the gain. We always do like that, she barked, vanishing only to return immediately and proclaim that the doctor needed to see me. I was dragged to a receptionist. What we have today? The outworlder manning the desk asked. Um, nothing. Maybe my elbow. We can help you with your nothing or your elbow. She then slapped a virtual stack of papers on me. Sign here, she rudely barked. In a daze, I began studying the many implicit pages. After five seconds, I had already taken too long. Nobody ever read that, the being declared. So I didn't and after many signatures I was led into a minuscule waiting room closely packed with sick aliens and humans alike. The hospital had placed a virus-feeding extraterrestrial in the center of the room. These so-called sick suckers are used as filters by infirmaries around the galaxy, I am told, as they remove pathogens cheaply. The one in there was very fat and very dead. I tried not to breathe. Finally, an attractive human nurse beckoned me into the doctor's office. Time for checkup. 
I happily left the Dioeus room, and when I beheld the human practitioner's well-cornered office, my confidence rose as the man was evidently of great standing. Busying himself with papers, the man paid me no heed, though. I restlessly skidded about in my seat when he finally spoke. Nurse Rita, help Mr. He paused without looking up. I had barely inhaled to speak when the clinician continued. Undress. How are you doing? He asked me. Good, thank you, doctor. Can't be that good if you're here. He chuckled hoarsely and fell into a hacking fit. After regaining his composure, he ordered me to open wide. Sorry, doctor, I don't require dentistry, I noted shyly. Your wallet, he cracked up. The nurse cackled. Oh, right, I chuckled. He ceased abruptly. No kidding, though, this is going to be expensive. I just have a minor discomfort on my elbow, an itch, really, I explained. And you're seeing a doctor for that? He looked at me curiously, then shrugged at the nurse. Before I could explain the situation, he continued, just messing with you, he slapped my elbow, we'll take good care of you. The nurse nodded and then shrugged. Remove your pants, he ordered. Doctor, is that, um, necessary? I croaked feebly, nodding toward the nurse and then whispered, there's nothing wrong down there. I will be the judge of that. Now make haste, I'm a busy man, the doctor asserted tapping his atomic watch. Yes, of course, doctor, sir. I lowered my spacesuit. Rita, have you ever seen anything like this? He asked the nurse, pointing at my crotch with both index fingers. The woman moved in closer. No, doctor, I've never seen anything like it. Thank you, Rita. That will be all. She retreated and immediately sanitized her hands. The doctor turned back to me. Don't fret. Male human reproductive organs commonly suffer from punishing effects in outer space. A vacuum forms in their bodies and, you know what I mean? I nodded, shook, and nodded again. The nurse sighed and checked the time. He continued, no worries, it's all confidential here. You're in the best of hands. He removed his gloves with a snap and then shoved them into a wall receptacle to eject them outside. The rubbish floated into space, where a group of small aliens rushed in to claim it. They'll use them for their burrows, to line them, insulate them, the doctor explained, watching the creatures pensively. Not good for them, gets into their tendrils and whatnot, into their young. He kept observing the critters sticking their heads and babies into the gloves. Nurago Tarantoga Elvangular, he suddenly hollered at the nurse. She burst into a cackle and left. Isn't she so hot? The doc asked me before she was even out. I nodded. Alien couldn't tell a human schlong from an arm. He pondered. Well, maybe in your case. This left me confused. She looks so human, I commented. Yeah, they're cheap, the doctor responded, shaking his head. Ever done it with an extraterrestrial? He asked jovially. I, I have thought about it. Sick, he shrieked, slapping my elbow. The nurse returned with a report and handed it to the physician. She brushed past my clothes and immediately re-sanitized her hands. That's unnecessary, I'm not actually sick, I said more to myself. I'm just here for a checkup. She regarded me pitifully. While the doctor studied my report, I shyly glanced at the beautiful creature. By a mood of nature, her species looked like very attractive earth women. Her iridescent skin glistened with what a human male could interpret as sweat. Intrinsic lip dryness led them to frequently moisten their mouths with an animated tongue. I was shoved out of my daze when the doctor continued. We recommend complete body replacement, he declared. I didn't know how to respond. He sensed my confusion. We don't heal or repair anymore, we replace. After all, who doesn't like sparkling new arms and anus? I again shrugged, nodded, and shook my head in every which way. Did you know that customer satisfaction with birth bodies is at an all-time low? He asked. I didn't, but upon contemplation, my doubts turned into enthusiasm. Doctor, does that mean I will live forever? It doesn't, he retorted. The parts come with an expiration date. That's government mandated. I can give you an extra few weeks, but that stays between us, all right? I nodded gratefully. The administration never bothers us about an extra week or two. Could be a computer error or whatnot, you know? I eagerly agreed. He added nothing further, and my mind drifted into imagining life with a new, artificial body. I realized that I had many questions. Doctor, am I trading not knowing when I'll die for an exact date of my expiration? 
No, you might still get hit by a meteoroid, he said, making a blasting motion with his hands. Something that's totally normal when you don't have proper shielding around your living unit. I signaled my understanding. I happen to know a great shielding contractor, the doctor said. My cousin, Bill Shelter. Here's his card and a pamphlet. I looked over the handout and nodded while the doc continued. His initials are BS, but don't let that throw you off. You should call him today. Call him right when you get out of here. He'll take good care of you. I agreed, but apparently not strongly enough. Hell, call him right now. He dialed on his communicator. Hey, Bill, how are you? Tress Malady here. Listen, I've got this great guy here named, he pondered, who just signed up for a brand new body, one of our 108 units. Yeah, they're great. Same you got. That's right. He grinned and winked at me. He doesn't want it damaged, so send him a quote. He addressed me. What's your unit size? 100 square feet, I replied. He shook his head. Small, but cheap. He spoke back into the communicator. Shoot him a quote for 150 square feet, will you? You have a special for that size? Outstanding. Yes, sign him up right away. I shook, nodded, and shook again very gratefully as he continued. So let's go ahead with that. Say hi to Marge. Spend the weekend on your cruiser? Sure. The doctor hung up and took notes. All went quiet for a moment, and my eyes wandered over to the nurse. She gawked at my crotch, suppressing a grin. Dr. Malady went on. Let's schedule your procedure. He ripped up a piece of paper and ejected it into space, pensively regarding the aliens collecting it. Not good for them at all. He returned his attention to me. The procedure will take place on Qualison 10, not covered by your health insurance, though. Are you taking Soylent Blue? I gasped. Qualison 10? That's a light year away. No problem. I'll hook you up with a hotel for the four weeks. Outstanding place. The owner's a good friend of mine. He picked up his communicator and booked a room. When I learned the rate, I coughed, but that might have been my brittle body decaying. Lucky, I thought, that I would get a replacement. After the doctor arranged transportation to the clinic, he organized rehab at the end of the procedure. Now that comes to a total of, he added two firm strokes to the bottom of a huge spreadsheet. Five million quantos. You pay cash? I gulped. Wow, that's a lot. I only have 10,000. 10,000? That won't even get your little elbow thing fixed. At least not on Qualis in 10. We could have saved a lot of time had you admitted your pauperism right away. The nurse sighed loudly. Gonna set up a procedure locally then, the doctor continued. Won't be as fancy as on Qualis in 10, I can tell you that. He reached for his communicator. Is Dr. So-and-so available? He listened for the reply. Of course he is. He made a face. Yeah, neither would I. I choked. My elbow began to itch. All right, fine then. I'll have him sign the disclaimers. He disconnected. What do you do for a living? Line skipper? Isn't that boring? At least you get some exercise. Need elbow grease? You wouldn't believe how many penises drop from people who take that. I always recommend my customers spend a week or two at Zero G Health Club. I can set you up with zero down for zero health. I mean health in zero G with no down, but then we've established that you're too poor. Never mind then. The nurse had me sign more forms and left. After she was out, the doctor encouraged me to tip her. They rely on gratuities to make a living, you know. As I put down a 20, he added, and so do we. I produced an extra 20 and passed it to him. He licked his lips and grabbed both bills hastily. We rely on these tips to make our living. Yes, doctor, you already said that. The cash safely tucked away, his gaze veered back outside and into the void beyond. The nurse will prepare you for robo-surgery. Robo-surgery, I gasped. The word conjured up images of people strapped to conveyor belts, mass procedures performed by the automated arms that had become so popular following the Clone Wars. Cheap, but with an unacceptable failure rate. Feet were frequently attached to arms. Hands were placed on legs, and legs were placed on heads. Superglue often makes such procedures irreversible. Thus produced freaks were frequently hauled to the entertainment world Carnivos 9, voluntarily, mind you, as they could no longer bear the presence of loved ones. The doctor sensed my unease. Don't worry, old chap. The procedure will be performed by a singular automaton, and a new one at that. I sighed. Well, new to us he added.
With the specter of automated surgery driven from my future, I much enjoyed letting my mind fly in the surgeon's office. I remembered articles on cutting-edge subspace surgery. The copies of the surge were submerged into another dimension using this hot new technology, while the originals went after their lives. Only after successful surgical completion would the operated body return to our realm and replace the original person, ailment-free. You won't know it's done until it's gone, was their slogan referring to your tumor. A tinny rattling from outside followed by a laborious mechanical wheeze forced me out of my reflections. The door swung open and an ancient bipedal automaton stomped in. The machine approached me and halted, its misaligned timing belt winding down with a wail. I stepped aside, allowing the thing to clean the room or do whatever it was here for. It pounded its chest, and after an eruption of rancid air, the whirring stopped. A hollow hunch rose from my stomach when the rust bucket remained in place, that this electrical artifact had something to do with my surgery. Good day, I am Robo Refurb Alpha. The system even linguated like a mechanical of old. Warning, someone has been creeping the hose, pi tal with the soul gem sucking a knee ma from the deceased. W what? R really? I stammered, sounding like the damn robot. What? What would they be doing with it? Black magic? I didn't know what to say. The robot went on. LOL, LOL, just messing with you. The thing simulated laughter. I joined in. Laughter is healthy, after all. Oh, I see. Ha ha. I laughed uncomfortably. I will now cease talking like a robot. The machine operated a switch on its chest. We are programmed to ease tension with humor. Of course, I thought. They'd want the patient to feel at ease. Oh, the foolery. What an advanced system this had to be. It stomped toward the window and went on. We will install for you the finest body available. But maintenance will be stiff. Frequent maintenance, that is, for such a fine frame needs tuning every 50,000 steps. It is that high performance. Clunking emitted from deep within the machine like dwarves were mining inside it. After slapping its chest, it continued. Pneoptic valve tuning, muscle fluids, waist draining, I interrupted. I won't be able to use the bathroom anymore? Of course not. The Boastbod XS wouldn't allow such nastiness. Detox happens away from your home and loved ones in the privacy of your hospital service center. I pondered over this. It made sense. Can I see my new body before the procedure? Just then, an alien nurse entered and whispered into the machine, whereupon the robot rushed out. Surely the device was a much-wanted specialist. The nurse looked me over, pausing at my crotch. Relieve yourself of your clothing, she said. I did as ordered, not uttering a word amid her continued stares. You look like my third husband, the alien finally said. I, I do. How many have you had? Two. I yearned for the robot's return. W will the robot Alpha come back soon? I noticed how furry you are, she said, running her eyes across my lushly coated body. She apparently came from an ice world. You know, funny fact, I said, choking a bit. We humans often remove it. Why? She began to run her tendrils over my plush. We, um, I wished I hadn't said that. Find it, um. My eyes traveled across her wooliness, but the words had already formed in my head. Unappealing. Her smile vanished. She stepped aside and spoke nothing more. Luckily, the Sergobot returned, yet its mood was also lowered. Let's get this over with, it said. Proceed to the operating platform. I did as asked and soon found myself lying down with a dividing curtain just below my head. The two went to work, producing much cling and clang, yet I could not see how. The robot addressed me. Sir, it appeared as baffled as a machine could be. Where is your bing dong? I, I don't believe I have one, I stammered. Oh, wait, the machine clanged its forehead. I've loaded the wrong anatomy. My mind desperately wanted my head to rise, yet I found that it could not. No big deal it said. Nurse, hand me that red thing I trashed. Are you sure you have the right file now? I asked feebly. I'm human. Did you load a human mail? Yes, yes, I'm 96% failsafe, rattled the machine. You're insured, so no worries. Upon this, the nurse whispered something into the robot's microphone. Oh, he doesn't have money for insurance, the machine computed aloud. Update. I'm sorry, you're not covered. You're too poor.
the nurse shot me a condescending glance. I grew increasingly edgy as I was still fully conscious, and many kinds of obscure noises erupted from behind the screen. It didn't help that the nurse often looked me straight in the eyes while producing an exceptionally nasty sound, her body jerking as if exerting great force. Out of nowhere, the silicon surgeon exclaimed, Yuck! What? What is it? Did something happen? I asked. Blood. Lots of it, it said. The nurse shook her head. Does that pose a problem? No, it's gross. Organic life is revolting. Look at all this wobbly stuff. Everything is wet and soft. One never gets used to that. Makes me rust. I, I'm sorry. I found myself apologizing once more. I try to think of these bits as cogwheels and springs, cables and lines, it said. Suddenly the machine's alarm sounded. Oops, it shrieked. What? Is something wrong? I shouldn't talk so much. It's distracting. But nothing happened, right? Don't worry. I don't. But I'm getting dizzy now. Are you? Perhaps you are only imagining that? I began to panic. Is everything all right? I feel very shaky now. The nurse once again whispered. Nurse Agro advised me that you're experiencing the effects of the tranquilizer. There's no need for concern. Everything is in accordance with your weight of 190. That's not my weight, was the last thing I recall uttering as my mind entered a world of molasses. Jeez, look at those red strings, the robot said, his disgust turning into confusion. Can you take them out? They're all connected. The nurse shrugged. And see, that's what they use to reproduce. They're the only beings doing it like that. He paused and looked the nurse over. Do you want to hook up later and replicate? The nurse giggled, then shrugged. Let's finish him up real quick and get it on. Then I was out. Suddenly the door flew open. The bang must have pushed me out of sedation. A supervisor rushed in. His eyes were on me at once. Oh my God, you tin fool, what are you doing? He came running over to the operating table, pushing the robot aside. Why is this there? I suppose he pointed. Is he alive? The sup nodded at me. I'm alive, I croaked feebly. The manager disconnected the instrument from the robot and yelled, Put that here and this there, you idiot. I will see you later in my office. And just like that, the raging man left. All eight sets of eyes were on me. This is your fault, the surgeon said as his apertures narrowed. I'm sorry, I uttered. Now both the nurse and surgeon fidgeted with hard, crude motions. The robot frequently turned to me to spin up attachments. It seemed like the machine deliberately moved its arms beyond the view barrier to rev up its saws, drills, or rasps in front of me. The unending howl of power tools began to unnerve me. They still hadn't produced my new body. I had hoped to catch a glimpse of it before being out. No tough feelings, right? I said, but no one answered. The nurse addressed the robot. He's still listening she whispered. Let's speak Hex. 63, 61, 6E, 27, 74, 20, 77, 61, 69, 74, 20, 74, 6, said the surgeon. They snickered. I blacked out. I woke in a different location. Some unknown nurse gawked at my lower body but rushed off when I opened my eyes. My attempts at viewing my fresh self were met with failure, as I could hardly move. Another caretaker arrived. You awake, good. We go to cashier, the creature said, steaming from its 13 orifices. Did everything work out as planned? I stammered. You alive, no? I nodded and she continued. Or maybe this all simulation like dream. How would you know? While I agreed once more, she rolled me off, banging the bed into every corner along the way. After traversing a maze of hallways, she pushed me into the last barrier, a parking spot next to a wall that looked a lot like where we'd started. She then walked away without saying anything. I waited. After an eternity, I stopped a random employee. She looked me over and said, You have to pay. Yes, I agreed. But is it safe to rise? I don't know. What did the doctor say? She tugged at my sheets. My patience was running thin. I haven't spoken to him. Can you please ask someone? Okay, she said, still yanking my comforter every which way. What surgeon's name? I, I don't know. She looked at me funny. You don't know? It was a robot. Robot? They're no robot surgeon. My heart froze. I hoped not literally, although at least that meant it was still there. Someone yelled from around the corner. 
is the new guy? Now, she remembered. Ah, new guy. Anyhow, you good to go or he would know have left you here. But he didn't put me here. It was a nurse, I screamed while still attempting to look down. Yeah, aha, uh-huh. either way. The outworlder was losing interest. A blanket still largely covered me. The nurse, for some reason, had difficulty getting it off and gave up. The numbness left my body. I probed my limbs and discovered that I had gained additional control over motions that felt novel. I moved an arm and a leg and felt the covers slip off. People passing me reacted strongly to my sight. Perhaps I was naked. Eager to see my shiny new self, I glided from the bed. My shadow was different from how I remembered it, with many added protrusions. I rushed to a glass door and saw myself. It. My new frame was shiny, all right. It was the shape that struck me. I had become a, I'm still not clear on the term, roborachnid? Panic boiled. A note was attached to my crawly legs. Gave you a metal body is less disgusting. A. I hailed a caretaker and demanded my former body be reinstated. The whoever told me that it was impossible as my old frame had been discarded. Just then, a motion outside the window attracted my attention. An object floated into view, larger than the usual trash hovering outside the station. It looked strikingly familiar. There was the herringbone sweater, the striped socks I had worn the day before. It was my headless body, now in a tug of war between scavenging aliens. I freaked. Stout hands arrived and threatened to pluck my appendages unless I paid the bill in full. Peace enforcement was called. The cops drew heat and leaped into defensive positions. Spider freak! By chance, an arachnid appeared. Not a robot, mind you, but a proper Cobb 5 spider. It ogled me with disgust and rushed off. That was it. I could not contain my frustration any longer. I jumped to attack. The police fired their blasters and finished me. And thus I woke. The nurse was right. It had been a simulation. A team of specialists surrounded me, concluding sensory tests. I was still alive. The operation had been a success. I strained my arms and legs and found they responded sans problem. Take it easy, buddy, said one of the technicians. Here's a mirror. He produced a selfie screen, lovingly styled as a reflective surface. When I gazed upon myself, my heart froze. But of course it didn't, as it was made of iridium. The outcome of the procedure was, once again, unexpected. Instead of a spiderling, I found my head on the surgeon's trash can tin trunk. Undo this atrocity at once! I screamed at the baffled team. Sure, sir, the cashier is down the hall, some idiot proclaimed. Screw that. I shook him like a baby. The robot did this without my permission. The sound of grinding gears emitted from my chest. I thumped myself. That felt better. We'll see about that, sir, said the idiot and ran out. He returned with the nurse who had me sign the dang papers earlier in her tow, the hospital director and some other suited fools. Conversing with both administrator and supervisor quietly, she repeatedly looked over, shaking her head. The wretched creature then left, and the hospital officials turned to me. I strove to look as angry as possible and must have succeeded as the men momentarily jerked back. She's lying, I screeched. I had laboriously raised my rusty fist when my family arrived. The children cried and my wife fainted. It was bedlam. I grew tired of drama, and while everyone engaged in loud discussion, my eyes veered outside. There, unseen by the arguing crowd, I found the robo-surgeon plus furry nurse zooming by in a snazzy, convertible space cruiser. The hairy wretch had wrapped her arms around my own fuzzy body, which was now installed under the surgeon's head, and had undressed to all but a pair of skimpy shorts. They zoomed off laughing and having a merry old time. I gave up and in. Here's my money. Just make me human again, I yelled, flashing my bite bucks card. A few days later, my body was exchanged once more. Not to my old self, of course, as my birth body remained at large. If you have information on the whereabouts of a robot with a human body and a furry alien, please contact me. End of transcription. And thus the broadcast ended. I'd like to point out that the narrative, as I received it, was in words rather than visuals. It was a literal account of the events. The experience was very different from a dream, or what my critics would call delusions. I was able to recall the situations described word for word and write them down as they occurred, using the exact spelling as it appeared in my mind's eye. Many questions remain. Is this what the kids mean by watching a TikTok?
Was this impossible account from the future worth ruining the dousing rod for? It leaves me with mixed emotions regarding the times ahead. Blasters, robots, space stations, and giant spiders? It's all as real as chocolate milk and the brown cows that make it. The message sounds like a cry for help. I want to assist. I started poking the red eyes out of those small robots the neighbor's children play with. They appear as innocent toys, but I know better. When the parents approach, I run. I must not include them in this conflict just yet. Actions in our time affect the future. Why was I chosen? They were looking for someone off the chart. Yes, off and beyond the map. That's exactly why. An unassuming person, beyond the government's radar, and with lots of spare time. It is clear. I must continue. I will listen. The Checkup, written by Oliver Arnold, performed by Adam Eleven Labs.